Okay. Even if still people are jumping in this meeting, I want to welcome you to this associate member meeting. If you remember, we had once uh, by end of November where we have reflected the different components, uh, in particular, all these new uh, committees, pilot projects that we have and uh, this was a bit new with respect that we had just a change of the terms of references and in this context possibly it, it got a bit lost that the most important activity of the IGS is related to the analysis centers that are generating the products to this analysis centers belong uh, the belongs of course the analysis center coordination activity and so we will have today a dedicated meeting on the most recent um so uh, analysis center um activities and we also want to have a look forward because this are meanwhile more than seven years where the team from GA and MIT, so uh, at the beginning it was Michael Moore, later Salim jumped in together with um, Tom Herring, uh, uh, doing the job as analysis center coordinator then it's, of course, the time to look forward and try to find a new candidate for this. So from this, if Alison, you can go into the agenda for today. This is just what is reflected in the agenda. We have first a report from the current ACC activities, then we, of course, want to go forward to a multi-GNSS combination. There are also several activities took place within the last years. One was hosted at GA for orbit combination. Wuhan can do a clock and orbit combination with this tool. And at GFZ also another alternative tool was developed. And I think this will take about one hour, this overview. And then after the break, Tom Herring will introduce the call for participation and describe the intended transition process. So this is more or less the plan for tonight. And it starts with some housekeeping uh, information from the Central Bureau. Please, Alison. All right, thank you, Rolf, and welcome, everyone. Uh, it's so nice to see you all here, especially those of you who are staying up late or getting up early, or uh, for those of you who it's the middle of the night, we really do appreciate you making time to join us all virtually, and we hope it's a, it's a fruitful conversation. Uh, I would encourage you all to uh, bring your questions and, and, and thoughts to the discussion period. We've allotted a lot of time just for having a community of practice to, to to talk about what's going on and uh, have any questions or if you have any uh, thoughts or anything like that, that is definitely time to bring it. So uh, all uh, contributions are welcome at that point. So uh, just a little pre-meeting housekeeping. Uh, I have my camera on right now, but uh, we would ask that most of you please keep your camera off so that uh, we can conserve the bandwidth, especially for our colleagues in, in lower bandwidth situations. Uh, if you would like to talk and we encourage that, uh, please do use, do use the raise your hand function and, uh, and the, the moderator of that session and I will take a look at this and try to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to speak. Uh, you're also uh, more than welcome to use the chat function if you're more comfortable with that. 
And uh, finally, before we jump into it, uh, as, as many of you have seen, the, the call for participation is available. And I'm just putting this up here just in case anyone has not seen it. It is available for download, so you are encouraged to take a look and uh, inform yourself. All right, back over to you, Rolf. Yeah, thank you for this introduction from your side, Alison. Now we are ready for the first contribution. So Salim will report on the status of the ACC activities at the moment. Please, Salim. Thank you, Rolf. Um, just try once more. Uh, can you all see my screen now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, thank you. And um, thanks everyone for joining in today. Um, since I'm presenting from Canberra, the land of Nonoval and Nambri people, I would like to start by uh, acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which uh, I'm presenting and acknowledge their continuing connection to land, waters and community. I pay my respects to the people, the cultures and the uh, elders past, present and emerging. Um, so I will uh, start by, I will uh, give an, uh, the update on the IGS analysis center coordinator and hopefully this will um, offer uh, context to the um, whole of the discussions on the ACC role uh, today. Just to quickly introduce the IGS analysis center coordinator is responsible for monitoring the quality of products submitted by the individual analysis centers and combining them to produce the official IGS products. Uh, the IGS ACC uh, also has the overall responsibility for coordinating the changes, developments and improvements within the contributing analysis centers to produce the IGS products using the latest models and standards. Uh, we actively collaborate with other IGS committees, working groups and pilot projects. And uh, currently uh, 12 uh, global IGS analysis centers actively contribute, contribute to producing the IGS products, uh, which we are uh, hugely thankful to. So before giving the regular annual updates of the IGS ACC for the year 2023, I would like to take this chance to uh, point out to a few of the key achievements that uh, GA and MIT have achieved over the past um, seven to eight years that we have been um, retaining the role of the IGS ACC. So um, GA and MIT took over the role of the ACC from the previous ACC at the US National Geodetic Survey since January 2016. Uh, one of the first things that was done at the time was to uh, was the transfer of the combination server from a local storage to the uh, Amazon Web Service um, cloud environment, which made it uh, a lot more flexible in terms of uh, removing a lot of overhead around uh, maintaining of the IT infrastructure um, uh, from the staff at the um, staff involved and uh, also made, made it a lot easier in terms of future transfers to the uh, other organizations um, um, and also all the benefits that the cloud environment just brings. Um, um, another uh, thing that we have been working on um, for the past few years was the development of new software for multi-GNSS orbit combination and uh, we have all also provided experimental uh, multi-genesis products as well as the Recro 3, uh, three constellation multi-genesis products. Um, uh, we coordinated the Repro 3 efforts of the IGS for the realization of the ITRF 2020, 2020 namely Repro 3 campaign in collaboration with the uh, Global Analysis Centers, Reference Frame Coordinator, Products Coordinators and Committees and PPPAR pilot projects. Um, there were two major terrestrial reference frame changes 
uh, that happened during this time. The first one was the, in the early uh, years of, um, of our role uh, back in Ju January 2017, where the IGS adopted the IGS 14 frame and the Recruit 2 standards. Uh, and the most recent one was in November 2022, where we adopted the IGS 20 frame and the Repro 3 standards, uh, which included moving to the long file lane products for the IGS files as well. And one of the most recent highlights was the introduction of a new IGS analysis center uh, in Japan. So uh, I'll now get back to the uh, regular updates from the last year, starting with this last point as the introduction of the JGX, a new analysis center uh, to the IGS, uh, which is run jointly by Geospatial Information Authority of Japan uh, and the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency. So um, just a very quick history on uh, how we, um, uh, we um, ended up with having the JGX as the analysis center since uh, for about two years, 2021 to 2023, there were extensive ser series of testing and assessment campaigns that were carried out by the IGS reference frame coordinator, IGS ACC, and the staff at JGX to uh, compare their products to the IGS combinations and to improve their products. Uh, this all led to uh, results being presented to the IGS governing board in July last year, uh, and the governing board accepted the JGX as a new analysis center candidates um, and after six months of their products being routinely assessed as uh, in the IGS operational products um, against the IGS operational products and being involved in the combinations for comparisons only finally in December uh, the governing board officially accepted JGX as the newest global analysis center. Uh, and since then, their rapid orbits and clocks, as well as their final terrestrial frame and or frames and orbits, started to be included with weights in the IGS combinations. So, including the JGX, we now have uh, 12 analysis centers that contribute actively to the uh, IGS products in different lines of products. Um, and again, I would like to thank all the analysis centers uh, because uh, they are the only reason that the IGS products fundamentally exist, uh, the main reason. Um, as you can see, um, Rapid line of products is the one that has most number of contributions um, uh, to the IGS um, from the individual analysis centers, uh, followed by final and ultra rapid. And since the Repro 3, we have a good number of uh, analysis centers contributing to the multi GNSS uh, products, including GPS, Galileo, and GLONASS. In terms of the product quality and reliability over the past year, operational products were delivered with expected qualities and latencies and with minimum, minimal outages. There were only three, out, uh, three delayed products, one for rapid and two for ultra rapid, and this was a huge improvement uh, compared to the previous year. Um, of these reasons for failure have been one problem uh, due to a, an outlier orbit solution uh, where the combination software failed to mark it as outlier. There was an issue in depositing the products to the global data centers and there was a storage disk issue in the combination server. There was also one instance of resubmission of the combined rapid clocks due to an issue in the alignment of the clocks to the IGS time scale. So going through some of these statistics over the past year and historically comparing them to the historical statistics as well, uh, the GPS ultra rapid products uh, are published four times a day with a latency of three to nine hours. They include a 24 hour observed uh, um, components and a 24 hour predicted components. Um, the figures here on the left is the historical uh, comparisons and the right is the most recent about one year comparison. And these are the comparisons between the IGS ultra rapid observed part uh, the, uh, or for the orbits and uh, against the IGS rapid orbits as the reference uh, here. As you can see, the median for the, uh, the median RMS between the two is, um, is less than 10 millimeter uh, in the most recent times. Um, here is just the same similar figure for the predicted part. Obviously, um, it's the um, predicted part compares uh, slightly worse to the rapid orbits uh, with a median of about 30 millimeters. 
Um, and if we look at the individual AC solutions for the ultra rapid orbits and how they compare against each other and against the combined um, orbits, um, the weighted ACs uh, have been always um, as a consistency level of below 50 millimeters compared to the uh, to the combined products. Um, going forward to the rapid products, uh, the, uh, they are published once a day uh, with a latency of 17 to 41 hours. Um, and their uh, inter-AC comparisons for the uh, rapid orbits are uh, improved compared to the ultra rapid orbits, uh, and they are usually below 15 millimeters for the weighted ACs. And for the rapid clocks, uh, we can look at the standard deviation of the clocks compared to the combined clocks, uh, and these are below 25 picoseconds for the weighted ACs, and as a rule of thumb, 30 picoseconds in clock is equivalent to about 9 millimeter of range error. Uh, and finally, uh, the final orbits, um, uh, they are published once a week uh, with a latency of about between two to three weeks. Um, and they are considered the highest quality products, uh, which, um, and are, which are uh, based on the highest quality processing models at the moment, uh, following the Repro 3 standards. Um, and um, as we can see, they uh, also have show the um, consistencies of uh, below 15 millimeters for their orbits between the weighted ACs. Uh, and looking at the clocks, uh, the um, standard deviation of the weighted AC clocks have been uh, most of the time below 15 picoseconds for the uh, weighted ACs. And in all of these clocks, we can see uh, a few things, uh, JGX being included as a new analysis center. The only exception is their clocks are still not being weighted in the final clocks as we have noticed some instabilities, but uh, we will keep monitoring. EMR had a, a bit of pause uh, during last year until between the switch to the ITR of 20, uh, to the IGS 20 frame and now, but they have uh, just recently continued um, providing their uh, products, the final products, their rapid have been always there, and JPL are still, uh, for their final products, they are still based on IT, IT ITR of 24 IGB for 20, IGB 14 frames. So uh, until they uh, finalize their assessments for their final orbits, although their rapid orbits are uh, in IGS 20 frame and weighted. And most recently, uh, we started to publish the multi GNSS ultra rapid demonstration products. Uh, we um, published them similar to the GPS. Uh, ultra rapid products about 20 minutes after them uh, with similar latencies obviously plus 20 minutes um, and similar strategies uh, um, apart from the fact that they are uh, being produced using the new uh, multi genesis software so they can so we could include the gps glonass and galileo um, the plots here go back to a few months ago and there was a bit of pause um, um, while we were experimenting things internally, but we started publishing them at, uh, starting from late uh, December last year. Um, so generally speaking, um, the results are very much similar uh, to the GPS only products that we uh, um, publish um, as of official operational products um, with the uh, comparison to the GPS only ultra rapid below six millimeters. This is a slightly worse than the what we observed with the comparison to the GPS only for the Repro 3. And uh, I think this is mainly due to the lower um, um, quality of the ultra rapid orbits, especially the predicted part compared to the final uh, or reprocessed uh, orbits. And for the GLONASS only ultra rapid, the comparison to the GLONASS. Uh, for the GLONASS multi GNSS ultra rapid products, the comparison to the GLONASS only ultra rapid IGV products that we uh, have been publishing for a few years uh, as experimentals is below 15 millimeters, which is slightly higher than the GPS only ones. 
uh, inter-AC comparisons for GPS and GLONASS are very similar to what we see with our uh, current um, official uh, products for the GPS at uh, below 50 millimeters. Uh, for the GLONASS is almost as double, uh, and for the Galileo is somewhere between in, uh, at 75 millimeters. Although for the Galileo, there are only at the moment three centers that are contributing uh, as weighted. So um, um, over time, I would uh, say the bit more AC is starting to uh, um, contribute to the Galileo. We could uh, hopefully see some improvements over that. And finally, uh, the extension of the Repro 3 orbit and clock combinations to the 2021-2022. This is up uh, until the GPS week 2237, where we switch to the IGS-20. So uh, for this backfilling of the Repro 3, we generally followed the same methodology as with the Repro 3 for the period 1994 to 2020. The only exception is that the combined clocks uh, are legacy clocks with no combined bias products. And this was due to only two ACs providing phase bias products for this two uh, year of backfilling products. Uh, as with the full Repro 3, the orbit combinations were carried out by the IGS ACC at Geoscience Australia. The clock combinations were carried out at Wuhan University, led by um, Professor Jiang Goi Keng um, as the IGS PPPAR working group, and the reference attitudes were calculated using the group software from TU Grass. For 2024, uh, a major focus of uh, for us, of, uh, of course, will be on the transition of the IGS ACC role. Uh, we are intending to open source some multi-genesis orbit combination software to uh, make it accessible to the IGS community, but also allow uh, future enhancements to the combinate multi-genesis combinations in uh, within the IGS. And we also continue to participate in the multi-genesis task force in developing a new fully multi-genesis combination software. Uh, as the as a consolidation of all uh, efforts between different institutes, um, we will support incorporating the yearly ITRF twenty twenty updates, and we will uh, also support the testing campaign for the inclusion of the Baidu and QZSS uh, in the operational products. I think that's uh, it for all my IGS ACC updates. Um, I believe that an, another item uh, in the agenda is the combination software. I can do it anytime. Uh, either I can continue, or if you want to say a few words, Rolf or Alison. Thanks. Or Thank taking you. any questions. Exactly. This is the intention why I'm jumping in. <laughs> um, so it just shown that uh, GA and also MIT have done really a big job within the last years. So we are really thank you, thankful for this activities. And are there questions to the report from Salim that we have got so far? Alison, do you see something? I don't see anything right now, but uh, if anyone has a question, they're free to raise the hand or pop it in the chat. We will also have some time, lots of time for questions later on if people are still thinking about what they might like to talk about. Yeah, at the end, uh... When we look at the second bullet from this slide, then this is a perfect transition. So the uh, ACs started in the context of repo three to include uh, three systems, at least a few of the ACs, meaning we have consistent um, products for orbits, clocks, biases. And the last step to incorporate this uh, to the uh, product generation is the combination step. And this is the last step that we have to do in the context of MJEX, 
really come from GPS and GPS GLONASS to a real multi GNSS combination. And in the last years, several activities took place. And this is what we are going to introduce now and start with Salim, who introduces the Orbit combination software that was developed this in the last years at GA. So. Right. Thank you, Rolf. Um, <clears throat> yes, I can uh, give a quick overview of uh, the multi-GNSS orbit combination software that I've been uh, working on, on at GA. Um, just quickly, uh, uh, the motivation, obviously, as you mentioned, has been the uh, inclusion of the multi-GNSS, uh, and uh, especially this became more evident with the Repro3 activities uh, when a good number of uh, analysis centers contributed to the um, Galileo and GLONASS, as well as the GPS um, <clears throat> for, uh, for their products. Um, the Orbit combination software uh, that we have been working on is generally built based on the uh, methodology of the legacy software. Um, and this has been mainly because uh, the legacy software has been doing an excellent job in maintaining the robustness of the combinations over um, the history of the IGS products. Uh, a major difference with our uh, software was the inclusion of a, a satellite-specific AC weighting to allow for uh, some of the different qualities between the different constellations, uh, although other weighting schemes such as constellation-specific or the legacy way of global weighting are also applicable in the software. Um, just a just looking generally at uh, as an uh, at the overall um, methodology of the combination without going into much detail um, there is an uh, pre-alignment of the orbits and then they uh, to, to the same reference to the same frame uh, roughly uh, and then an estimation of the seven uh, transformation parameters between h ac and a simple mean of the orbits using the l1 norm um, then the weights are calculated based on the absolute deviations uh, compared to the mean orbit. Uh, there is an outlier detection uh, algorithm. Uh, and finally, the com combined orbit is uh, a weighted mean of the um, orbits, transformed orbits to the um, same frame. So in terms of the software architecture, uh, it is compatible with, with Python 3. Um, the input uh, configurations are all mostly uh, set up in a single YAML file, which makes it much easier to control uh, the um, strategies and settings. Uh, the input uh, files are obviously the ACS orbit sp3 files and also the metadata files like the satellite metadata or the maneuver information or uh, the ERP files, etc. Um, the uh, outputs are the IGS long product file name, standard orbits and summary files, as well as the more machine readable uh, JSON format summary files. Uh, the so software is mostly written as object oriented in terms of the Python classes um, to, uh, to allow flexibility on uh, adding uh, new features into the software uh, as easy as possible. Uh, the philosophy uh, that the software is written in is mainly uh, that the structure should be fit for the IGS operational product generation. Uh, so we try to keep uh, more or less similar um, structure as with the legacy uh, combinations, but making it improving, making it more simple and uh, and improving where uh, needed. So uh, the second item in the philosophy is keeping it simple and also keeping it adaptable to changes because especially given the all the uh, different approaches that's going on at, uh, in the air, in the space of the combinations. So um, I think that we have made it adaptable enough that even if, for instance, you want to apply a new uh, method for your weighting, with a fair bit of effort, I think it should be possible to add it to the software. Um, 
it has different modules and each module has classes and or functions in it. Uh, some of the main modules are, for instance, the orbit combination module, the uh, helmet transformation module, and the uh, input output uh, of data where you could read or write to different uh, file formats like SP3, um, maneuver information, uh, metadata, satellite metadata, etc. And a, a major feature of this of the software uh, is the flags uh, for the satellites, like. Uh, so at each time we know each satellite and each AC, for each AC solution, if the, there are missing satellites, uh, unweighted, excluded satellites, etc. And this is very important when doing a lot of calculations. For instance, if you are looking for the common uh, healthy satellites between the uh, analysis center solutions for the helmet uh, part, uh, calculations, for instance, uh, that's uh, really handy. Uh, this is just a, uh, an example of the input YAML config file, just to give you an idea. Um, so essentially, as you can see, we can uh, set up the uh, weighted, unweighted, or excluded uh, analysis center solutions for, and you can do this by constellation or even by specific PRNs or SVNs. Um, some of the other settings are the sampling rate of the combined uh, uh, orbits, um, the weighting method, satellites by sat, which is satellite specific, but also global or uh, by constellation. Um, some of the input files, obviously, uh, for the um, metadata, for instance, and as uh, also the thresholds for the outlier. Uh, removal procedures. Uh, so again, adding the whole idea is that make it flexible. So if you want to add some more models or strategies, we can always, uh, with a fair bit of effort, add them to this YAML config file and changing a few things here and there should be fairly easy to uh, modify the software. Um, I won't go, given the time, I won't go to the details of the validations because I feel I feel these has been these have been reported uh, before. But just generally speaking, the results for, from the new software were validated in the Repro3 uh, campaign, uh, where we could see comp um, um, good comparisons with the GPS-only legacy combinations, um, and these results were presented in the IGS annual report in 2021. Uh, and some of the PPP test results that showed that the combined uh, orbits using this approach are uh, always one of the best or uh, the best orbits uh, among the individual between the individual ACs. Um, there was a recent publication, thanks to Radek, uh, on taking the uh, lead on the authorship of this paper, about where we have explained the methodology for the combination with the uh, for the uh, with these with the new software for the repro3 uh, as well as validations with the slr observations uh, and obviously the most recent uh, demonstration of uh, the um, new software in an operational environment is the uh, multi genesis demonstration uh, ultra rapid products that i've already uh, touched on in my acc report um, Thank you, Ralph. I think that's uh, it from my uh, introduction to the orbit combination software that uh, we have developed at GA. Yes, thank, thank you for this uh, presentation. Are there questions to Salim? May I ask one? Yeah, sure. So what you are currently running uh, in experimental mode is the satellite-wise weighting. Yes, uh, the current uh, ones the, are. Are the like... other approaches also somewhere running or? Um, no, unfortunately, we haven't been running the other approaches. But if you feel the need, we can uh, try to run the other approaches in parallel. Um, at Just, least yeah. or if one can have one week access to the AC contributions and all three ways uh, of waiting, then it would be interesting to run some tests. 
Yes, sure. With the Repro3, we did uh, run a test campaign with not the full Repro3, but for, I think, a year or more than a year of the, um, I think, global weighting compared to the satellite-specific weighting. But obviously, yeah, that's a, uh, I, I can try to run it, run it for at least for a short period of time uh, to see the differences for the ultra-rapid ones. Yeah, I think uh, at least for some initial ex uh, yeah, experience, one week would be good. And if one finds, for instance, a week with a maneuver or whatever, whatever where you have then a different mixture of ACs for the different um, satellites, maybe that this is really uh, interesting to have a look at it. Yeah, sure, thanks. Just by service. comparing the orbits, but looking also at the residuals from a network solution based on the different orbits of this, uh, the access to the original ultra rapid solutions that you're putting into the combination would be good as well. Yeah, sure, thanks. Okay. So, are there other questions? Raised hands. We don't this, see any. This seems not to be the case. And if Alison confirms it, then it's for sure the truth. Then, yeah, we have uh, other developments coming from Wuhan. And Ingui, may I ask you for introducing the software package that was developed uh, in Wuhan? Uh, yes. Um, uh, wait a minute, just I'm sharing my, my screen. Yes. Uh, how can I share my screen? I, I, I just. You have at the bottom this video, and right from it is something with share. Okay. If you have also the English version. In the Chinese version, I cannot help you. Okay. I need to complete the system to have a computer to access my device. So, um, Okay. Yeah. Um, could you uh, just let the body to have the presentation at first? This is because pretty uh, constrained on my science through the web webex meeting. Okay. Do you think that it helps if we just swap? What? This GFZ, if you swap this GFZ uh, presentation that you can transfer your slides on the right computer or send it to the central bureau. Yeah, Zhang if you want to send it to Leo and me, we can, uh, we can also try to project it from our side. Oh, okay. Okay, then Benjamin, if you are ready, then I would propose to swap these two presentations and then continue with the development at GFZ for a new combination software. Please, sure. Benjamin. Uh, um, Alison, can you share the slides or shall I do? Um, I can share it from my machine if that is more convenient for you. Up to you. Otherwise, I can try. I will try. Okay. Give it a try. <laughs> you can see something? Yes. Yes. Great. Okay. So, I will report about our orbit and clock combination software. An effort we started uh already in 2018 so some of you might remember uh, the discussions we had in the uh, during the wuhan workshop 
So the idea was to develop a new um, multi-GNSS capable orbit and clock combination uh, software where we determine the weights based on variance component estimation. And actually with the focus on m uh kind of the yeah, development was um, to have a consistent weighting across constellations covering also the range of uh, provided constellations in the individual solutions. And to have, I wrote here, uh, workarounds uh, related to the provided products because we have a different range of products provided by the by the MJAX ACs, or we had that at least um, when we started the activity. Technical facts: so the software, which is called Spock, uh, is written in Python. Configuration is done with a single YAML file, so kind of similar to what we heard in the previous presentation. And the software will be made available uh, for usage within the IGS. For further license conditions, we have uh, currently some discussions. But I gave here a, a, a yeah, kind of a list for uh, uh, the tests we made. So we used, of course, the MJAX products and we published the results uh, for the orbits in um, two years ago in 22. And a recent publication on the clock combination uh, was published just last week. For the Reaper 3, uh, we did also a publication. Uh, we tested the orbit products that was mainly done in the uh, PhD thesis, um, Gustavo Manzor, who uh, did most of the work for the software and he, he, he implemented most of the algorithms. Uh, we tested also LEO orbits. And uh, of course, we participate and the IGS uh, task force and the combination. So kind of the combination workflow. So the blue uh, line on top is the, uh, is the orbit combination. So of course we start with some pre-checking then we do alignment and transformation. We define uh, core satellites to be used in the VCE. Then actually the VCE is done it's an iterative pro process to determine the weights and then we actually do the uh, orbit combination which is then the weighted average with the po possibility to uh, have kind of a feedback loop to go back to the helm transformation the second line here is then for the clocks there we start like in the uh, legacy way so to say with the radial correction uh, some checking for the individual clock Products, determination of offset and trends to a reference AC, followed by um, outlier detection and ISB alignment, and then again variance component estimation and the weighted average as a uh, combination. Then, so weights can be defined for individual satellites, blocks, constellations, orbit planes with uh, indicated here on board that we go for the constellations or oh, this is let's say the main the main idea here and there is also a slr based orbit weighting scheme currently under development now i would like to show you a few results and the results are here um process or created for the operational products Dur during uh, the last quarter of last year, so uh, quarter four and 2023. And on this slide, you see first the orbit combination for the final products. The slide is structured in the way that we have here the GPS, GLONASS, and Galileo solutions. On top, we have the RMS. On the lower part of the figures, we have the weights. And then we have kind of a heat map covering the mean orbit differences. So what we see here is, um, yeah, I would say rather what we expect in terms of the RMS. Uh, it appears that there's kind of a yeah trend in, in, in some AC solutions uh, for the GLONASS and for the Galileo, but um, Overall, it looks very promising. And if we go for the heat map on the right side, I um, marked there with a box the comparison to the IGS 
final product or final yeah, combination. And there we are within a, a centimeter. Now, if we go for the clock combination, same final products here. Uh, the picture is yeah quite comparable. We have um, for the for the Galileo uh, clocks, we have a bit of jumps in the weighting between the ACs. Um, but if we look then for uh, the mean differences, and again there the last column is uh, the comparison against the IGS combination, we are within. Yeah, 40 picoseconds. And now we have the same uh, also for the rapid products. Here again, the orbits, the same style. So the GPS, the Colonials and Galileo solutions. Uh, for the Galileo, of course, we have only three solutions. So there is kind of a, a bit of a variation. Uh, for the weighting, you see kind of uh, spikes there. If we compare then also from the heat map, we are again with a centimeter or even yeah, seven, max seven millimeter um, with the uh, with the IGS rapid product. And the same then for the clocks. It looks uh, similar, I would say, for for the behavior of the GLONASS and also for uh, the Galileo solutions. There are a few days uh, where the weights are not given here. So this is something we have uh, to fine tune uh, in the, in the uh, yeah in the configuration. Um, but overall. Again, here the comparison against uh, the IGS clocks is again at the same at the same level. Yeah, and that's it. In short, about our uh, orbit and clock combination software. Thank you, Benjamin, for this report. Are there questions to Benjamin? Simon. Yeah, thanks for that presentation. I've got a couple of questions. The first one is, how do you choose your reference AC for your clock alignment? I noticed that you said you chose a reference AC for that. I was just wondering how you did that. Okay, so um, I got the question correct that uh, the question was, which AC is chosen as reference AC? Yeah, that's right. Yes. Um, basically, it could be done in the configuration. This is what I think what we what we what we did here. So was it was it based on any metric of all the ACs or was it just a, a choice that you made um ad hoc? Um actually I'm not sure uh, what we did for the uh for the test uh, for the for the uh quarter for this test which uh, was shown here. I have to double check that. Yeah, uh, and my second question is, it seems like your combination agrees better with the rapid products than the final products from the IGS. I'm just wondering why that might be. Good question. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm right now I don't have a dedicated uh answer for that okay thank you but did but you it's, it's, I, I would say it's in the rotation? same did you consider the rotation matrices from pole uh, for the finals no they are not considered here but the might be that this is a difference get large. yeah yeah might be that this is a difference that you are then more consistent to the current rapid where this doesn't exist Exactly. That would have been my suspicion as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I thought the, the question was more for the, for the clocks, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then Nacho has a question or has at least a raise hand. 
Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Now, I was just wondering about the, uh, the performance difference between what Salim, the software Salim presented and the software that you're presenting, Benjamin. Have you evaluated what the results are? Are there any pitfalls that one of them avoids? Are you able to identify, I don't know, outliers better? Or is there um, a reason to pick one over the other? Or should we be running both, actually? I don't know. I, uh, I think I think Salim showed a combination of ultra rapid products, so that might explain part of the difference. Um, of course, but this goes more than to the combination task force. Uh, there is some comparison activity, but I see also that Salim is raising his hand. Yeah, Salim. Yeah, just adding that for the repro three, I think there were some comparisons done, which generally I can't remember the numbers on off the top of my head, but generally they agreed well. But at that time, I think the GF set combination was not uh, mainly was uh, yeah. I, I'm not sure if that at that time they were doing the this squares various component estimation or at least the same various component estimation that you are doing here. Um, but yeah, uh, I think yeah, I, I don't think. Um, I think this is essentially, as you said, the task for the multi genesis task force group to see what are the benefits from each software uh, to to take advantage of. Yeah, but I don't think there have been a lot. Maybe Oliver can correct me if I'm wrong. To, to my to my understanding, there has never been a systematic comparison of the two software packages against each other for a harmonized test case. Um, both packages have independently been tested by GA and GFZ on a couple of test cases from Raypro, from MGEX or MGEX Orbit, etc. But there has never been, say, a dedicated campaign to compare one against the other for exactly the same input data. So it's it's very difficult to answer the question that Nacho posed at this point. And if you are, if you suggest natural to run both software packages, then the question is, should we have a combination software that combines the combined orbit of the two? Exactly. But you, you know, well, the history of the ITRF that we've had, obviously the CATREF and we've had the DGFI solutions for a while. Um, I don't know. There were two different ways of combining all the solutions. That was obviously for a completely different problem, but, um. I know that that always had some very interesting discussions and, and conversations. So I just okay. wonder because you usually avoid pitfalls. Some people see certain pitfalls on one side, like avoiding certain kind of outliers, identifying bad or good, uh, you know. So I, I, anyway. I, I, I fully agree with you. There may be, say, specific features of the individual software packages that are different and that may make it worthwhile to say, have both of them running if we can afford that. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a matter of resources to, to, to run the two and to systematically compare them. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thanks. It would, it would be a great thing if we can run two independent, uh, combination procedures that, uh, check each other. So it means the IRS is doing it. For instance, and from this, uh, if the new ACC has the resources, then it would be cool. And I'm sure that we can learn a lot of things from this. So there are two raised hands up now from Oliver and Salim. Is there, are this old hands? Uh, or uh, mine comments? is an old hand, but I have a, have a new comment. But Salim, please go ahead. Uh, no, I, I was just just adding to the, con the to to that that um, uh, also um, looking at the different features of each software, it might be worthwhile when we assess them. Maybe just using each other's uh, features from the other software, so to to complete. And I think that was the whole point of the consolidation of the efforts in the multi genesis task force as well. Um, obviously, running in parallel is a, is is uh, ha has its own advantages um, uh, but also um, looking at the other uh, software algorithms and just uh, picking things from things like outlier removal as Nacho mentioned for instance um, I think uh, it's also worthwhile thinking about the, there, there, are, 
there, there are two items where I think um, the two software packages differ from each other and from um, from the current IGS combination software. One is the fact that, uh, Salim, correct me if I'm mistaken, but um, for the moment, the, job, the software of GA is an orbit combination software, if I understand it correctly, whereas GFZ has now, say, done the second step also to include clock combination, as we learned from Benjamin's talk. That That is a difference. Um, the other one is, um, I think, a, 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 it applies mostly for both packages, if I understand it correctly. None of them does a com does a alignment to a kind of say absolute reference frame. There is no use of Sinex files currently in the GA software. I'm not sure about Salim software whether you have the possibility to read Sinex files as well, but I think you currently run it without Sinex files. Um, we only pre-align based on the rotations from the Sonix um, combination, but uh, not reading the Sonix files themselves. Yeah. So you have the, at, at, at least you have, say, one path of input for an absolute reference frame alignment, which I think is currently not implemented in the GFZ software, Benjamin. Uh, it's currently under implementation, so we are working on that. While we are talking, but it's the same. It's the same. It's the same. Um, <laughs> while we are talking, um, uh, but it's the same approach, just using uh, the rotations, not reading the uh, entire Sinex file. Okay, thank you. So, uh, I have also a question, of course, Benjamin. We are using really this variance component estimation instead of this. Uh, averaging approach, so which is just a zero step of a variance component estimation. That you compared also the weights from the legacy software that the individual ACs get with respect to your results. So meaning what is the impact that you do the full variance component estimation and the legacy software stops more or less after the zero iteration there. Um, I think we did that, but that was yeah, kind of in the beginning when, when we, when we started, we have not compared for this test, but of course it would make sense to have a look if we could get the weights from the, from the legacy combination. Okay. Now then I give this question the task force and yeah. so, um. Uh, is something from Radek? Uh, what the sound now it goes away? It's just, I, I guess it's just, uh, he's just saying that this is part of the activity yeah. in the task force. Okay. Then we are ready for the third presentation on new software developments. So I think Jingui has somehow managed it that we can have this presentation now. All right. Um, okay. Um, Looks nice. Yes. Do you have a full screen? Uh, yeah. Uh, cool. Okay, Thanks. you can see my screen, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, so uh, today we'd like to talk about the software uh, for the combination of satellite clocks and the biases uh, from Wuhan. Uh, so this is a cooperation between the Chinese Academy of Science and the Wuhan University. Um, so our software is called CKCOM, uh, which, is a sh which is short for this clock combination. Uh, it is dedicated to multi-gen SS clock and uh, bias combination practice. Uh, so we can do both a legacy clock combination without uh, code or phase biases, and we can also do integer clock combination uh, by incorporating the uh, code, uh, satellite code and the phase bias. Um, so we can do it for GPS, Galileo, and uh, QZSS. Uh, we also output the comprehensive summary files to, pro uh, to provide uh, some statistics for the combination uh, performance. For example, uh, uh, for the combination residuals and the consistency and the outlier uh, reports. Uh, for the for the for the relevant ACs to analyze their performance at their uh, satellite clocks, uh, this software software will be op uh, will be open source across IGSAC and ACCs in the future. Uh, 
And uh, I'm not going to talk about the details of the algorithms within the software. I think the Alexa software combination is similar to other software which can do this similar work. And the integer part combination from this software is based on the alignment of the of all AC specific clocks uh, with the uh, with some specific integer clock uh, contribution from uh, from some ACs. So after we align all of these clocks together, we can uh, have the integer nature of the of the undifferenced ambiguities to be kept in the final combination clocks. Um, this is the a simple description of the software is uh, is written in C plus plus language, and uh, we ha we can we can read the orbits and the actual coterminants, and as well as the antenna PCLs from uh, from the uh, AC contributions. So in this way, we can have a precise alignment um, by uh, by considering the uh, cell of attitudes differences uh, implemented by different ACs. And uh, at the moment, we can have the achievement of about 10 picoseconds consistency for GPS and Galileo clocks, and about 100 picoseconds for GLONASS. Uh, this is the uh, achievement for the for the recent years. For example, after the 2015, uh, because of the Warbit improvement and the Warbit combination performance, uh, we can also have a have a have a comparable achievement for the cellular clock and combination, which is can be better than 10 picoseconds. Um, uh, so this is the package package structure. Um, so uh, we uh, we run the software in the Linux system, and uh, uh, it's it's very easy to install. Just to run the make uh, the make command in the Linux environment to install the software, and we have a PC version as well for people who are uh, not familiar with the Linux version. Um, so this is the configuration file. Um, uh, so it's uh, it's just a control file. And uh, we can specify uh, which constellation, which constellation we are going to combine. Uh, for example, the uh, GPS, uh, Galileo, or the GLONASS, and we can exclude some specific satellites such as GO4 because uh, it was problematic over some time. And uh, we can uh, uh, we can also uh, exclude some uh, problematic AC solutions. And we can choose which kind of uh, combination mode we want. For example, the Alexa clock combination without phase bias, and the integer clock combination with the phase bias to ensure the end, uh, to ensure the PVP ambiguity resolution capability. And we can define the define the pattern of file name as well as some other summary statistics from the combination residuals. So it's very easy to use, and uh, um, and there's the, there should be no problem for some new players to to run this software. Okay. Um, so this is the uh, this is the this is the practice we have done in the past uh, past two years for the repro three uh, clock and bias combination. Uh, this is a very uh, complicated combination because we have the lax combination in the early and the earliest five years, and then the clock and the code and phase bias combination for for the following twenty years. And we switch from the GPS only combination to GPS GLONASS, and uh, Galileo combination, and we have various uh, varieties of ACs contributions from uh, over different periods. For the earliest time, we have only three ACs, but for the final uh, 20 years, we have about uh, seven to eight ACs contributing to uh, the combination. Um, so this is the output uh, from the red box. We have the station and cellular clock uh, Renix file to the output, as well as the combined code and phase by Renix file. And we have a summary file to report the combination performance. Um, this is the this is the cooperation between the uh, between the Geoscience Australia for the orbit combination and the Wine University for the clock combination, and we use the reference attitudes from TUG uh, for the Warbix file. Well, this is the typical performance over the past two decades, and I see uh, from the repro three. Uh, so you see here, uh, the combination performance improves over the over the years, especially for GPS and Galileo. And after 2015, we have a performance, we have a combination consistency of about better than uh, 10 picoseconds. You can see that numbers from the uh, top line of each uh, each plot. But for GLONASS, uh, this performance uh, is uh, is mixed uh, because of the um, uh, the the soldering, the, the code bytes problem. And uh, we can normally achieve about, uh, about better than 100 picoseconds performance for GLONASS uh, cellular clocks. Um, 
So this is the uh, typ uh, typical performance for the uh, PPVR using uh, the combined energy clock. Uh, we have the position results based on the combined products, uh, which have the highest robustness among the ACs. Uh, so we make up uh, we made a comparison between the combined products uh, with the with the solution from code and the TUGs. So you can see here, uh, overall they are comparable. But the the outliers from the uh, from the combined products is uh, uh, outlier rate from the combined products is lower compared to uh, the code and the TUG products. Uh, at the moment, we have uh, begun uh, we have begun to uh, provide routine clock and bias combination service uh, uh, within the IGS PVR pilot project. So you can see from the web page we have the. Uh, we have the waiting. Uh, uh, we have the wait, uh, waits from each ACs uh, for uh, uh, within this combination, and we have the weekly clock advice uh, consistency uh, statistics plotted in the in the in the bottom left figure, and then we have the validation using uh, PVAR software. So we compare three ACs and as well as the combined products in the rightmost column for the east uh, for the east, north, and north components. Um, so we have the uh, we have the uh, we have the waiting strategy for uh, seller specific, uh, constellation specific, uh, specific, and the global uh, waiting as well. Uh, so this is similar to the Warby the combination software from from the Geoscience Australia. Um, so um, uh, uh, this software is only for clock and device combination and is uh, is has been uh, collaborated with the GA's Warby the combination software successfully for the Repro three. Okay, this is all I have. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Pingui, for this report. Are there questions? At least I don't see a raised hand. Okay, then this seems not to be the case, even if we are uh, 10 minutes, oh, there is something. I need to ask if it's different from Pride. Jingui, can you read in the chat and the chat? Uh, let me see. Question is where this CCOM software is different from Pride. Uh, yes, um, the, the Pride software is uh, is for positioning uh, using uh, IGS LR clock and uh, and Warbits, and this CCOM software is uh, is for combination is for for clock combination. So they they have different purposes. May I ask you, Jingui, whether there are, is a paper or something like this where we can read something about the algorithm? Uh, yeah, we have. A, we are preparing um, a paper for the Reaper of Three clock and device combination, uh, but it's under it's under revision across the participants from okay. different ACs. Okay. Um, are there other questions? Otherwise, I propose that we do a five minute comfort break now. And we, we reconvene at something 15. Is it, is it right for you?
So welcome back. Um, I with the introduction of these three packages, I think we are in a very good situation to do really this last step towards multi DNSS. So if I am a quite old man, and so I remember the EGEX GLONASS experiment that was launched in the 90s, and this was just the same what we have now with MJEX, that we started in a parallel way, the GPS only processing, and then based on this first computing GLONASS orbits, and at a certain stage, a few um, analysis centers started the combined processing, but then the initiative is the combination stopped with this uh, parallel GPS and GLONASS combinations that we still have today. So uh, it was uh, then transferred somehow to this ECLOS and uh, now we are repeating this story more or less with MJEX, but not looking just on GLONASS, but on three other constellations, but the hope is that in the context of the transition of the ACC function, we can really go this final step and have really a multi-GNSS uh, combination based on the software packages that we have seen so far, or possibly even something different where nobody is aware about about this transition. Tom wants to give an uh, yeah, introduction on the plans and also introduce this uh, call for participation. Okay, so thank you. Please, Tom. Um, yep, I'm, it was a pity I missed the first hour of this. Uh, I had a conflict with another uh, telecom that somehow this got overlapped on top of. Uh, so the um, call for participation document is, um, available out there for people to read. I didn't plan to do slides for this because I would like it to be sort of a discussion of how we want this um, evolution to happen. As Rolf just said, I think what we're hoping is that this transition will be one which takes us to a true multi-GNSS uh, combination um, as the standard product rather than as an experimental product. And Hopefully, you know, the concepts behind what we would like the new ACC to be is essentially software, which is running in an environment that allows it to be easily transferred to another ACC, either, you know, for an interim period or when a new ACC is uh, selected. That was the concept behind uh, the Geosci Geosciences Australia installation into the um, uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, into the um, um, Amazon Web Services is that uh, in principle, the um, when the ACC changed, and this is still possible, I believe, as uh, Salim's on the line, I assume, this is still quite possible that simply the new ACC would take over that uh, Amazon Web Services account or, or port it within something of the equivalent. So to make that transition much easier rather than having to uh, reinstall from scratch, which is uh, typically the way it had been before. So in terms of the transition, I think we have a number of uh, fallback positions that we can take. As I said, our preferred would be a multi-GNSS um, combination that runs in a, a platform that is accessible not just to the ACC, but also potentially for a new ACC in the next transition, and that the software be um, open source as much as possible. So that again, that transition can happen. And um, the uh, that's sort of our ideal situation. I think our minimum uh, requirement would be that the current ACC, what's called the legacy software, is simply taken over in an Amazon Web Services mode and continued, and then um, the uh, multi-GNSS uh, combinations continue to be uh, developed and software for that perfected to allow a transition at a later stage. I, I think that's the least 
ideal situation at the moment because many of the ACs are in fact generating uh, multi GNSS products at the moment and to continue having a GPS only official product. Um, you know, it's something we would like to avoid at this time if just to make sure that we, we are progressing forward in time. Um, and so, yeah, I think that issue of a platform that can be transferred uh, open source software as much as possible. There is you know, potential, I suppose, for some limited um, 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 act, you know, limiting access to some degree. But again, that's not our ideal uh, situation. Our, our, our ideal expectation is that it would be open source so that it could be transferred um, to another entity because you know the ACC role, as Salim will, I'm certainly point out, um, is a lot of effort. It's um, you know it's one and a half FTPs, um, and it's a fairly substantial cost in terms of um, the Amazon Web Services as well. So it's something which groups that take it on, um, it is I think hard on resources for them to continue doing it for extended periods of time, um, and so that being able to easily transition the ACC uh, is one of the ideals that we would like to have at this point. So uh, I think this is meant to be a discussion um, type of session. So if people want to start um, speaking up or Salim, you could also probably add some comments from your perspective as well as to uh, the transition as you see it. Yeah, thank, thanks, Tom. I think you uh, summarized it quite well. Um, in terms of maybe, uh, yeah, you you uh, mentioned the summary of resources, these resources and commitments. It might be worthwhile just to um, say that you, you would see in the call for participation that 1.5 FTE, which could be likely to FTE, especially with initial training and transition. And also with the Swartz want to point out that uh, during the campaigns like a Repro 3 or other testing campaigns, the, uh, the so, so the 1.5 FTE would might uh, be, might have to uh, increase to the two FTE. Um, so, and also these, the, the Costs for the processing depends in depending on where, where, how the processing is done. Obviously, it changes throughout the time. Like during the operational hours, there is uh, the operational um, um, uh, product generation. It's just, uh, it's usually a flat cost, but then doing experiments just adds adds to the computing costs. Uh, one other thing I uh, I was just thinking maybe was while mentioning is. Uh, since the ultra rapid products, uh, especially, are uh, published four times a day, so ideally uh, it would need um, monitoring the products on a 24-hour uh, basis. For for the current operations that we do, uh, we monitor three of the ultra rapid products instantly, but one ultra rapid products if you, with a few hours delay. So ideally, it would be. Uh, ideal to have 24-hour uh, uh, monitoring, uh, depending on the limitations of the organization and the staff involved. But also, more importantly, during the um, weekends, for instance, or public holidays, that has been something that we have had to arrange uh, always uh, within the GA when we wanted to uh, for the weekend, so usually rotated uh, roles in terms of monitoring the products in the public holidays or uh, the weekend. So these are some of the things that I think in terms of commitments, I think uh, institutes should um, take into account. Um, it might be, yeah, uh, I think you have, you have also seen the updates that I gave from the ACC, so I think that the that kind of uh, summarizes most of the operational products that we, uh, the ACC is mainly responsible for, uh, but it's also the coordination activities as well. So in, in addition to the uh, product generate combination, uh, it's also the coordination activities. So the IGS ACC needs to be able to um, 
run meetings across the IGS analysis centers, and these get uh, more frequent, close to the uh, repro efforts, I would say, mainly, but also the testing campaigns like the Baidu KZSS campaign that we are uh, we will be involved with. Um, obviously, there is always support. I've, I've been, I think we've been grateful to get support from uh, people like Paul Robishing from the Reference Frame co uh, Coordination and other IGS entities uh, and on an analysis centers, obviously. But it's, uh, uh, this is a sort of commitments that I think ACs should, uh, candidate ACCs should consider. Um, yeah. yeah. I think also in my mind, one of the critical things for the IGS in general is we have these very fast products, which are very popular, the ultra rapids and the, the real time, which, you know, in the event of a major earthquake, for example, um, in the Pacific Rim somewhere, one of the nice things about having something like a, um, you know, an AWS installation, which I know some of them did this, you can move it from Sydney to Frankfurt, for example, it can be in both places. So if something dramatic happens, that sort of level of access allows another group to take in, you know, if, um, you know, it's unlikely that Canberra would hit a big problem, but depending on where, you know, we put something out in uh, Los Angeles, for example, um, you know, in a major magnitude um, eight earthquake in Los Angeles, you'd want to be able to shift it. So part of our robustness of this new ACC is that capability to do that sort of shifting in the event of a major emergency and keep products going. Um, also, in my mind, what is most critical for the IGS in the long term is um, the stability of the finals products and the repro product ultimately, um, because that's the finals in particular is what people are using to do long term studies, climate change, slow slip events. These things don't need to be analyzed within a couple of weeks, but it's critical that you don't have systematic things happen uh, in those time series. So that's another critical role is to keep an eye on to make sure the systematics uh, are understood as we evolve. And that is, you know, particularly with something like GNSS, if you bring in a whole new constellation, um, you know, concerns that the, the results from that constellation aren't going to be fully consistent. You know, the classic one is the antenna face center model, uh, which, you know, clearly if we'd just taken Galileo and GPS as given to us, uh, they would be very inconsistent uh, for their face center models. And, um, and that's the sort of thing we have to be cautious of in the in the long term stability of the products. So, yeah, so the ACC role is there is this operational aspect to it as which is critical, but there is also this extra, you know, organization role and watching products and things, which is Salim points out. So from that point of view, you certainly do need um, a level of expertise to be able to to do it. But you should not only speak on the uh, work that is done. So it means uh, this is the most prominent position that we have in the IGS to offer. It's the one that people see uh, first when they speak about products. Then this is the name of the ACC that is seen first and from this. It's a really very important position within the IPS. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think um, um, talking about the pos good point, uh, the or uh, how to say, uh, well, um, the good positivity of it. Like I think, I think for me, for instance, as an um, taking the role of the ACC for the past few years, it has been great for me to get involved in a lot of. Um, in, in the IGS community and in the lot of science and um, of, um, related to the GNSS in general, uh, but also get to know a lot of people, um, make connections, see networks, and it has been also good for my organization as well. So uh, I think uh, just getting to know people and uh, making those connections um has been has been a really great advantage for for me so uh, i think uh, a great advantage that the acc role brings to the uh accs is uh, is the level of connections and and the as you said rolf like the level of being 
uh, being seen as well uh, in the community uh, and making those connections, I think is is really uh, um, beneficial to the person and to the organizations as well. Yeah, I think this visibility for the organization is more or less uh, what you get back if you invest this uh, one and a half or two FTEs into this position and you can uh, is the role of coordination. You can also uh, somehow direct the development within the IGS with the aspects what Tom mentioned. So from this, it's really an attractive job that we have to advertise here. But of course, it's not a job that you can do uh, yeah, in the night or mm -hmm. in, in Saturday afternoon. When the family is calling you, <laughs> so it's really a big job that you have to take over. So from this, you have yeah. to be sure that you and, uh, that your organization is really supporting this activity. We, we, yeah, I think we, it's the organization that's critical. It, yeah, yeah. You, you need to have the support from the top, from the the people with the money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, just just saying that working on the weekends again, like, is manageable as long as you have at least two people involved in the organization. That comes from the organization supporting the role. Um, so we have been uh, doing um, this for as most of the time as two people uh, in GA and just just rotating between ourselves on weekends, uh, say okay, I'll be around and I'll take care. But some weekends, okay, I'll. I'll just go and to a place where no there is no internet. So I know the uh, mm -hmm. my colleague uh, <laughs> as, uh, Jamie has has been actually uh, taking care of the stuff. So yeah, and previously Mike more as well. But uh, what we also uh, know as ACs that are running ultra rapids, that you also take care somehow on the. A performance that it doesn't crash and if in the same context one can organize something in that direction then it helps of uh, of course so from this we get uh, something which uh, is new with this constellation that we have GA and MIT that are hosted in two quite very different time zones is that in the before there was the intention that the ultra rapids are just running and the rapids and finals are then really verified mm -hmm. now with the uh, time zone in australia then of course this is very inconvenient with the rapids but of course you had then the opportunity to check also the ultra rapids and in combination with Tom, it was then possible to check all the protocols combinations. Yeah, although I must admit with the legacy software, that was um, not as um, successful as we might have thought. <laughs> um, yeah. just, just because of the scripting nature of it and in a more modern um, uh, environment, you know, of the, I didn't see uh, Salim's presentation, but I saw the slides. I've I've seen some talk of your combina orbit combination before. I think with more modern um, uh, techniques, it's a little easier to do that. And again, that's the advantage of having this sort of open environment where two different people can do. So in principle, I think that does sound really good. I think your robustness in the, the system, the ultra rapids, I think are fairly robust in the way that they, uh -huh. We've been through a long, again, that's one of the potential issues with going multi GNSS, right? Is there's going to be a, a new set of conditions that uh, we haven't necessarily seen that much before. And I think even Salim Sol's uh, slides with the Galileo, right? There was one of the ACs seemed to have some issue and it pushed off. Um, and that's, you know, as time goes on, you learn what those things are and you, you put things into the software that stop them from having a major impact. And uh, but that with the multi GNSS, um, you know, particularly once we get uh, the face center models for BDS, 
um, you know, that's going to be another thing that can be different between uh, the new set of experiences that we don't have not had good cases of yet. Yeah, but that uh, these are challenges should not hold us back to go this way. Otherwise, oh, yeah. we will be in the GPS world plus something in many years from now. And uh, if we claim to be the uh, international GNSS service, then we would, should really take now the uh, chance with all these available tools to yeah. go this step. Of course, uh, we have to be careful uh, for the reasons that you have mentioned, but I think there is no way around to just identify the potential problems and uh, find the solution for them. And I think that was the advantage of the repro three being a multi GNSS repro because you had, and, you know, processing that old data back in 2000 and stuff. That's where the real problems are. So if you catch all of those catching the modern stuff is far less of an issue. So, but you're right. We definitely need to move forward and uh, I don't want to make it sound too <laughs> tough to do this, but again, I think the issue is in, you know, the. Ultra rapids and, um, you know, again, it's a service that we provide on a, a best effort, right? We, we're not commercially, um, required to have a certain level of product. So if an ultra rapid goes bad for 6 hours, it's not the end of the world. Um, and so, yeah. so that does relieve a little bit of the pressure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, now we have three people that are entertaining the audience with a nice <laughs> discussion which I like very much. Uh, can we open the discussion uh, to the wider audience possibly? Did somebody read this uh, document that was provided a week ago? Ah, uh, Urs has a question. Please, Urs. Yes, I have a question to you too. Um, first of all, many thanks the work that you are doing but the question is you are two persons from two different institutions even on two different continents how did you work together how did you share the work in practice can this be a role model <laughs> well sort of we both speak the same foreign language called australian <laughs> uh, no well um you know, when we started, you know, I would actually go out to Australia and we work together physically out, you know, in Australia. And that's going to happen in the same transition this time, I think, is uh, um, more than likely there will be a period in which uh, you physically visit the site and work together literally side by side. Um, and also the, the nice thing with, well, not the nice thing, one of the things we've gained in the last couple of years, right, is all this remote uh, communication, which is now much simpler than it was uh several years ago so that helps a lot um yeah i don't know it's it seemed to work out okay <laughs> yeah i think it's sometimes actually works in favor of us like i sent something uh in the uh in the later hour of the day as a question to tom and then in the morning i got already the answer so <laughs> sometimes it's worse the other way um mm -hmm. But yeah, I think I think uh, it has it has worked pretty well, and it also has the advantage that we have in different two people in two different two times different time zones in terms of the operational products as well. Uh, so there's always one person uh, from one part of the world that could potentially look at the any major issues if if it needs to be. Um, and, and yeah, and I think, I think generally speaking with, with the past few years, Tom has been, uh, providing his expertise, I think, as me, as a, uh, uh as a more, uh, new people to the field, uh, to the field, I think, um, um, Tom, Tom has been, uh, doing a great job in, uh, taking the leadership on, um, on the major changes and improvements and any specific issues that go unnoticed. Tom usually notices them, things like the ERP, uh, problems, for instance, sometimes, um, um, so I think, I think it has worked pretty well in terms of, um, the expertise plus the, 
um, um, the operational work that we are doing. But it also means that the two institutions, in principle, can go together. Yes. Share yeah. the work. Well, yeah. Although, again, a university working with a um, essentially a government agency sort of works out because there's a lot of flexibility on the university side. You know, I, potentially, I could imagine maybe some bigger issues if it was two uh, government entities uh, with regular. With regulations, etc. So, yeah, universities can be very flexible, which I think benefits this considerably. <laughs> yeah, at least I can confirm as far as it was visible from the outside, it was a very good uh, cooperation. Not sure what you have done behind the doors, mm -hmm. but this shall be in the close, uh, should stay in the closed doors and rooms. <laughs> so, Philip has a remark. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we can. I have, uh, two questions. The first one is I read in the request for proposals that the the minimum length of the term for the ACC is four years. Is there a maximum? Will it be sort of recompeted after four years? Or if the whoever wins the role or takes the role, will they have the ability to just stay in it uh, forever until they don't want to anymore? I think if they're performing very well, my sense is that uh, we would be thrilled to keep an, a well-performing ACC. We would be thrilled to keep them on. And I think the average duration groups have done the ACC role is about eight years, right, Rolf? If I remember just no. NGS had it for about eight years. So I think after about eight it years. It was four years. And then when it was at NGS, then we had the first time that uh, they continued for a second term, and now we have the next example where it worked for two terms. But uh, I I'm not sure. Uh, I don't have the terms of references on hand and don't know it from the head. But I assume there is no uh, limitation given there. So uh, whether it's a good idea. Uh, to have a situation situation like in the IRS or IBS that you have an ACC forever. Mm -hmm. uh, it's another question whether some fresh blood is needed from time to time, but uh, as long as uh, there is enough input to the community, nobody will uh, ask for another ACC when uh, you are willing to continue the job. And um, have there been a, a fair number of uh, proposals submitted yet? Or do you do you know how many you expect to receive? I hope for an infinity number <laughs> that we can really make a decision. <laughs> um, so it means this call for participation is uh, one week old now that it is uh out so and considering that at first uh, the group needs uh, to discuss internally whether it's a good job for them or good opportunity and then you need to convince somehow your management to uh, support this uh, all this position so if i would have received already uh, an answer to this uh, call for participation after less than one week, then I am not sure how comfortable <laughs> I should feel because uh, then it's a question how well it is consolidated. Okay, thank you. Alison, you have unmuted yourself. Um, yeah, I would just say when, when organizations are ready, as it says in the call, you, know, you can feel free to submit to, to it to the Central Bureau. Um, one thing that uh, is not explicitly noted, but is, is very welcome is, as we were talking about, two different organizations working in tandem uh, so that it does not necessarily need to be just one organization or just one location uh, for a proposal. So, uh, if your organization is thinking about maybe making a partial contribution, 
that's also something that you could put into a proposal say that you know we we can't make a full contribution but we would be happy to make a contribution in this uh subset of the tasks so uh, we want to make sure that we are being as inclusive as possible and and really benefiting from the great example that tom and salim uh, set for us and, and showed that uh, this kind of a two-party ACC was actually benefiting everyone. And I'd also say anybody who is interested, and, and I've already had discussions with different groups, but feel free to contact us and um, just talk through what we see as the issues and stuff like that. So either one of us, depending on time zone that you're in, um, you know, I think that's, you know, we'd be happy to arrange meetings to discuss the different aspects of this with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Yeah, and I also wanted to add that if you think you can, your organization can make the commitment and resources, but you don't have, for example, the software to do the combination, I think from all these presentations today, we could see that the uh, centers were happy to share the software, at least within the OIGS community, as far as I can understand. So uh, that shouldn't be a burden in terms of not uh, just uh, um, you not going forward. I think as long as you can. Uh, make the commitment and resources and have a some level of expertise in the field. I think uh, the software shouldn't be an issue and we can um, during this time, I think uh, you can always contact the uh, ACC or other organizations of your interest and um, and uh, discuss how uh, you can work with someone else's software, I think. So I can also make the statement I have seen the legacy software last time when it left GFZ. This is 16 years ago, something like this. And well, it was really horrible at that time. And if I see then this clean Python implementations that you have done and that have done at GFZ, even if they are not perfect, uh, then it's at least something which is for sure much better than the old legacy software. So from this is, is then something which one can really hand over to somebody else as well. And there's what somebody else can also understand. So uh, what I would uh, underline again is so I think we will not get the definitive answer who will be the next ACC tonight. But if you have at least got some interest in this uh, job, then uh, you can come up with a full proposal or you can also uh, indicate that you can take or that you're interested in a part of the job. So we had this job sharing where the operational work were most, was mostly done at GA and the um, coordinative work was mostly done by Tom. So from this, uh, this is uh, something which uh, is of course a model, but if you say, okay, we are interested in a smaller subset of the job, then uh, please contact the current ACC team, the Central Bureau, or me as the chair of the governing board, and then we will see how it, it will come together that we have then a good proposal that we can start the transition. Uh, I think at the end we said in May that the yeah. Uh, ACC team gets uh, the retirement from this job as soon as possible. Yeah, the, this year is the is when the the role runs out. So I, I think our our sense is that continue until the end of this year, and that there would be some period of uh, essentially a dual ACC running. And that probably could be as little as three or four months, depending on how things are uh -huh. configured in terms of software. Yeah. Yeah. Are there other questions, comments?
And then I hope that we have convinced you that it's a cool job that the IGS <laughs> has to offer and that you will discuss it with your management. And uh, then, yeah, uh, we hope for uh, many answers of the, to this call for participation. <laughs> May, may I suggest, Ro, for Alison that um, a, a follow-up email after this meeting is sent with some of the additional information that we provided in here in terms of, uh, for instance, um, AC is working with the, uh, as partial contributions, I think those might not be explicitly mentioned in the document. So maybe if uh, for, for people who didn't attend this, uh, this meeting, just to promote uh, more widely as much as possible. Yeah, absolutely. So, good Thanks. idea. And Alison, the recording of this meeting is going to be available. We can make it available. I think that would make oh, for me that would be great. I would. I want to see the first hour. <laughs> absolutely. See what I missed. <laughs> okay. Then, do we have uh, any other business? Something else to be discussed? And um, yeah, uh, we can close this meeting for today. Great. And thank you for the contributions for the discussion that we had. And looking forward for your answers to this call for participation and see you in Vienna or at latest in Bern.